Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than a hundred years. PSENG, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. This is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us on NJ Spotlight News. As the state and nation remain in a wait and see mode with President Trump casting down on a COVID relief package poised for approval. That's not stopping the efforts here at home, though, to combat the virus. With ramped up inoculations for health workers today, Governor Murphy and state health officials were in Tom's River at the Ocean's Health Initiative Center, where the first of two doses from Moderna's vaccine were administered at a drive through site. After receiving the vaccine, workers waited in an observation area to make sure they didn't suffer an adverse reaction. So far, more than 27,000 medical employees across the state have been inoculated. By the end of the month, the state health department says it'll have received more than 405,000 total doses from both drug makers. The arrival is a relief for many frontline employees, like Michael Minkin, a physical therapist who works with geriatric patients, among the first to get inoculated at the drive through today. I haven't seen my family for uh, Thanksgiving um, and some of the other holidays, um, and I'm doing this because I just want people to know that uh, I'm doing it for them. Uh, I care about all my patients um, and I care about my family um, and I think this is one step closer uh, to being able to battle this virus. The state is also announcing a partnership with Rite Aid, providing vaccines for home health care and hospice workers, just as officials ready to launch the vaccination programs at our long-term care facilities next week. As the number of new positive cases continues upward, nearly 5,000 reported today, more than 445,000 total, and the second straight day of triple-digit fatalities with 103 more lives lost. After leveling off last week, hospitalization numbers are again on the rise, with more than 3,800 patients and the highest number of those in the ICU since May. Despite the uptick in positive cases and warnings from state officials, it appears not everyone is calling off holiday gatherings and plans. Airport terminals are bustling, albeit far less than normal years, but still at levels health experts say should cause concern, especially as a new strain of the virus is waiting in the wings. Michael Hill reports. Air travel increasing just ahead of Christmas, and so are the COVID-19 numbers. New Jersey reporting triple-digit deaths yesterday for the first time since June. Over 300,000 people have died in this country, and not all of them are elderly people. And a lot of people are in hospitals. We are taxing our hospital system. We are taxing our healthcare workers. And so I think what we need to do is stop and think not about what we want, but what our community most needs. And what our community needs is for us to stay at home. Air travelers are ignoring advice to stay home this holiday season amid headlines of a new United Kingdom strain of COVID-19 that's 70% more contagious and likely already has arrived in the U.S. I think it's a very frightening prospect. I think the one upside of this particular variant is that thus far it does not to seem seem to create a, a more virulent disease, meaning it's not necessarily more likely to kill you. However, there is another variant that's being found in South Africa right now that is, and it, it's showing uh, a higher risk of hospitalization in young people with no comorbidities. Several countries, not the U.S., have banned travel from South Africa. What about banning travel from the U.K.? You know, it might be premature to do that, Judy. I don't think that that, that kind of a draconian uh, approach is necessary. I think we should seriously consider the possibility of requiring testing of people before they come from the U.K. here. But I don't think that there's enough evidence right now to essentially lock down any travel from the UK. Is United Airlines doing that or considering doing that? Well, we are having internal discussions about what that would potentially look like. Um, 
uh, as well as talking to our partners within the, the state and federal government about what things that we might need to do. But it is something that's under consideration, but no decisions have been made at this point. While United Airlines considers a potential policy change, United's Aaron McMillan says the airlines is doing to its airplanes what it started in the spring, and it's requiring passengers to wear masks and report any signs of illness and more. And we're continuing to to look for innovative and new things that we can continue to, continue to do and and aren't resting on our laurels, so to speak, but continuing to you know evaluate what else we can do to continue to keep people safe in this time. There are situations even now where there are people for either business or because of certain family emergencies that they absolutely have to travel. So I'm happy that the airlines are doing what they can to make that as safe as possible. I think, as you rightfully noted, the flip side of that is it gives the impression that travel is safe. And it's not, there, there is no safe right now. There's safer um, and that's good. Montclair State University epidemiologist Stephanie Silvera advises avoiding the airport where new strains of the virus leave and enter the country. Um, it really does increase the risk that this variant and other variants are going to be brought to this country. And that can spell disaster. Michael Hill, NJ Spotlight News. While health leaders are advising against any travel, transportation companies sure could use the cash. Both ridership and revenue at New Jersey Transit continues to plummet. Rail riders are at roughly a quarter of the amount pre-coronavirus. Still, there is a silver lining if you look hard enough. The reduction in service and passengers has allowed the transit agency to complete projects, repairs, even those positive train control requirements. So what's ahead? Here with me now is the president and CEO of New Jersey Transit, Kevin Corbett. Kevin Corbett, great to see you. Thank you for taking a few minutes with us. You know, it wasn't long ago that federal regulators were actually targeting your agency as um, being having the possibility of not meeting the positive train control deadline. Did the reduction in passengers in some way actually help the agency complete this deadline? Yes, yes, it did, uh, Brianna. Uh, you know, when we came in two years ago, the project, no one thought we had a chance at all of making. We'd only 12% done uh, and had just, you know, we have 300 plus miles uh, of track. It's at all the equipment, the computer systems, all that. So, uh, and I would say that we, we made some really tough decisions in 2018 that had an adverse impact on our our customers on the service end. It was a, a tough summer, but we uh, were able to get the installation done to make that 2018 deadline. But last few years, we've been doing tens of thousands of test runs on our trains and having that reduced uh, passenger service, we sort of made uh, lemonade out of lemons by being able to take the uh, reduction in service we had in the spring when the COVID uh, the epidemic really hit, pandemic hit, uh, allowing us to do more testing and uh, catch up on, uh, you know, uh, on our testing protocols. All that good stuff aside, we know revenue is down, ridership is down. Are you concerned at all about cuts uh, or or layoffs even? I know that there were some rallies from union members uh, with the SEPTA line this week. Um, there's a lot of concern about more CARES Act funding coming or not uh, arriving. Uh, where are you at as far as looking at layoffs and cuts uh, in the in the next fiscal year? Well, I think we've been in the last few years, we really concentrated on right sizing the organization, getting our budget tight, doing, you know, we came out with our first ever five-year capital plan, 10-year strategic plan. So financially, we have a, we have a new CFO. We're, we were in good shape through June uh, financially. Uh, we don't have debt that a lot of other public agencies have, you know, uh, you know, with their municipal bondholders, those kinds of issues. Uh, so we're in relatively uh, good shape. And then what we are hearing uh, with the legislation that passed uh, yesterday is that with the second tranche of the uh, CARES Act or whatever they're going to call the act, uh, funding that we should actually, that'll help provide a cushion until ridership comes back. So uh, we're relatively speaking, we believe we're in good uh, shape. But, if, you know, we have to manage the budget. If we don't have that, then we'll have to make uh, appropriate cuts. But we have enough lead time that we can do that in, in an orderly way if, if it uh, is necessary. And, Layoffs is something we're trying to avert. Uh, you know, we have a good relationship with labor. We've worked like crazy the last few years to rebuild our rank of engineers, bus drivers, conductors. So it's the last thing we we would want to do. Are you still? Is the agency still then stable through the end of this fiscal year? So then until June, beyond that, are you even able to look beyond that at this point? Yeah. Yes. Yes, we are, and I think that's you know, you look at what scenarios depend on how much state. Uh, 
aid. I think the new budget coming up, we have an indication from Treasury for next year's budget. We're starting the budget cycle now for, you know, the July one is our start of our fiscal year. So uh, we know what we're going to get from the state as that budget finalizes and we see the gap and uh, what we would have to do if we don't get, uh, you know, federal money. But right now it looks like that federal from what we hear from uh, Senator Menendez's office and our other delegate members, it looks like we will be getting enough to uh, cover that gap uh, uh, further till as ridership, uh, until ridership uh, resumes to normal. Kevin Corbett, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Oh, as always, Brianna, great to see you. Thanks. It took years of backroom talks and political maneuvering, but within just a handful of days, state lawmakers managed to move full votes on several large pieces of legislation, a massive corporate tax break bill, framework and decriminalization for recreational marijuana, and restructuring of the state's largest health insurer. There's plenty of support for the plans, but there's also pushback over the speed with which lawmakers push the final bills into law. Senior correspondent David Cruz reports. When you read this bill, this bill gets better. On that, you'll have to trust the governor because even by trend standards, the New Jersey Economic Recovery Act, alternately known as the State Incentives Program Bill, moved through the legislature with such lightning speed, five business days, that few people had a chance to even see it, much less analyze it. The bill had the rare effect of getting conservatives and progressives to actually agree on something. There's a bit of a hubris here to think that they are perfect and that they they caught all their mistakes and that there's no need for anybody outside the halls of power to have a, a good look at this, right? Because honestly, even if you want to give them all the benefit of the doubt in the world, there's, there's benefit to having a public process because you have experts who are not in government who can say, hey, you worded that wrong. Hey, this language doesn't do what you think it does. And to, to not even have an interest in allowing time for that is just concerning. So, no, you really can't pass good legislation this quickly. I don't care who you are. It's atrocious. You know, it was introduced, what I saw was introduced on a Friday, the 18th, and it's voted on on a Monday and at noon. So basically no time for the public to take a look at this bill. And it had you know, basically crony capitalism, a lot of pork in there. Uh, p the government picking the winners and losers, these grant programs where the connected people are getting all the money. This is what we did. And it was done, you know, Christmas week with no oversight and no transparency. So it's very, it's very bad way to run the government. At up to $14 billion over seven years, the bill's weight will be felt on budgets still to come. Michelle Siakirka, president and CEO of the New Jersey Business and Industry Association, actually likes the bill. She acknowledges the Trenton hurry up and wait and wait and hurry up, but says if you're going to be a watchdog, you got to be a watchdog around the clock. David, this is not uncommon to 90 percent of the bills that go through the legislature and get to the governor's office here in the state of New Jersey. Now, BIA, understanding this is how the game is played in Trenton, have a myopic focus on bills that move fast. Uh, and we are constantly monitoring. And that's why our team is always 24 seven because uh, we can't miss a beat. Which begs the question, why do some bills like a millionaire's tax or criminal justice reform or cannabis legislation seem to take forever until someone decides, it's usually these three guys, that it's time to move on a bill like a massive tax incentive program whose previous version seven years ago was similarly rushed through the legislature. And I think for, for Trenton to operate in the way that it did this month, which was fast tracking a lot of very, very important bills, it shows that they don't see that they have a responsibility or a role in improving people's trust. Yeah, New Jersey is essentially an oligarchy. It's run by some rich guys and they call the shots. And when you become governor, you dance to their tune. I mean, where did Corzine come from? Goldman Sachs. Uh, Christie was made by his brother's money from Wall Street. And then we have Phil Murphy, another Goldman Sachs alum. And so who are they dancing for? Whoever they're dancing for, they appear to be okay to do that dancing in the dark. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. 
Well, it's being called a modern way to fight poverty. U.S. Housing and Urban Development Secretary Ben Carson was in Atlantic City this week, cutting the ribbon at the city's new Envision Center. Centralized hubs where residents can get workforce training and skills for their field, as well as COVID help with emergency food and PPE distributions, along with 300 certified contact tracers on site. The centers are the brainchild of Secretary Carson, who calls it a more effective way of pulling families out of poverty. People themselves have the ability to do things, but very frequently they don't know the pathway to take. And that is going to be considerably more important. That doesn't mean that money and resources aren't important. They are. But that's why we have the, the private partners who are coordinating along with the Envision Centers. There's a lot more money in the private sector than there is in the government, and together we can make it happen. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Well, we'll call this one the President Trump surprise. It looks like that $900 billion COVID relief bill that may not get signed after all. Rhonda Schaffler has more on why the president is reversing course and today's top business news. Rhonda. Brianna, so much for getting a stimulus check next week. That's in jeopardy after President Trump found fault with the $900 billion stimulus package approved by Congress. The president wants to increase the direct payments to Americans from $600 to $2,000. He also says the bill includes wasteful and unnecessary items. The president didn't specifically say he would veto it, but even if he does, there may be enough support in Congress to override. The legislation is also tied to a measure funding the government, so without that, a federal government shutdown is possible on December 29th. The holdup in Washington comes as another 17,600 New Jersey workers filed for new unemployment claims in the latest week. Labor Commissioner Robert Asaro Angelo says that New Jersey's unemployed workers are in dire need of additional economic assistance from Washington. 500,000 New Jerseyans will lose their federal unemployment benefits the day after Christmas. Many state residents who normally work in New York are now working from home, but they are still paying income taxes to New York. New Jersey says that's double taxation and has filed an amicus brief with the U.S. Supreme Court in support of a case challenging the rights of states to tax non-residents. State Senator Stephen Araujo has been saying for a while that this double taxation is unfair. He believes if the law changes, it would be a win for both residents and the state. New Jersey residents would pay less tax to New Jersey than they paid in New York. So it's not only the fact that the resources would go to New Jersey, those resources that the residents are paying, would actually they'd have more money in their pocket. The Murphy administration says keeping that tax money in New Jersey could provide up to $1.2 billion in annual revenue for the state. Kenilworth-based Merck will provide up to 100,000 doses of its experimental treatment for COVID-19. Merck signed a $356 million agreement with the U.S. government to supply the doses through the first half of next year. Merck's treatment is used for hospitalized patients who are severely ill. It still needs to win emergency use authorization from the FDA. Now, here's a check on the stock market today. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. New Jersey is opting out of a regional plan to reduce carbon pollution from cars and other vehicles, leaving just three states and the District of Columbia to take part in the program known as the Transportation and Climate Initiative. The TCI would put a cap on greenhouse emissions from cars, trucks and buses, but likely bump fuel prices by about five cents a gallon. So is that the reason New Jersey isn't signing on? Our energy and environment reporter Tom Johnson joins me to explain. Tom, thank you for joining us by whatever means necessary. What reason did state leaders give for not joining the TCI? 
Well, they were a little cagey in their response, but they indicated they still support the concept, but they want to work out more details, specifically about making sure uh, communities already overburdened with pollution don't suffer more because of New Jersey joining this initiative. It seems like, Tom, that five cent bump in fuel costs may have, though, offset some of the other problems that the state is incurring with the emissions. The, the problem is this is an election year in New Jersey, and I think the administration, as have other states, hasn't said this publicly, but they don't want to see a gas tax, another gas tax coming due on uh, customers in an election year. So uh, they're going to use the time between now and November to see if they can work out the problem. And they may take another look at it in November. Where does this leave the state if at some point leaders decide they do want to sign on? Well, they lose time. There's, uh, there's uh, a lot that needs to be done to deal with climate change and various laws that require the state to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 80 percent below two th 2006 levels by 2050. And also, they're supposed to get uh, 330,000 electric vehicles on the road by 2025. And the longer they delay this, the harder it is going to be to achieve that goal. All right, Tom Johnson, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. Well, we've got just two sleeps till Santa arrives, but for a lot of families this year, holiday gifts and giving will be out of reach due to lost jobs and cut wages from the pandemic. The need to help our neighbors has likely never been greater. So organizations and residents around the state have been hard at it, collecting toys and delivering a little holiday cheer. Here's Leah Mishkin. You hurt for these families. The Carroll family was feeding more than 400 families a week at the peak of the pandemic. Kelly Carroll, a chef and culinary teacher at Hackensack High School, says he got the idea after hearing about the food insecurity plaguing one of his students' families. And that's what I thought to myself, you know, what better thing to do than go and try to raise food for our students in the Hackensack community. And now that the cold weather came and COVID started to spike up again, we're starting to see more and more uh, that people are struggling. His wife, Corey, a special education teacher, says that's why the couple and their two daughters wanted to help this holiday season. They collected more than 300 toys and food for roughly 60 Hackensack families in need. This week, they went to hand deliver the items. There are a lot of stories attached to these families. One is a child without health care and he has a tumor in his leg. Seeing the emotion on the faces of relief, of help, of love, that's the magic. They're just so grateful and happy that there are people in the community that will help them out. The family got this thank you text from one fourth grader. Thank you so much for helping. Uh, my parents are crying of happiness and... Uh, you like our angels this Christmas. It was something along the lines of that. And it just, it, we, I read it in the car while we were still delivering <laughs> stuff. We just started crying. What does it mean to you to see your daughters helping out in this whole initiative? It's one of the biggest things I would want to instill in them. A desire to spread the holiday cheer is why a virtual Our Lady of Lords nurse, her husband, and their six kids delivered handmade cards and snacks to the entire hospital staff in Camden. They collected the items with the help of students, teachers, and families from eight Washington Township schools. Newark police officers and firefighters did their part to bring holiday cheer, handing out toys to kids in the city with their annual Toys for Tots giveaway. It's the same drive to help deliver happiness that has the Carroll family vowing to continue their work. The first night we brought um, a bag of like toys and it, this was a family of uh, four kids. And when we brought it up to the door, um, the four kids were chanting, we won, we won. And that was absolutely adorable when they saw the toys and it was 
it was amazing to see, but also heartbreaking because you want you just want to do more. More for neighbors, friends, students, loved ones, and strangers. I'm Leah Mishkin for NJ Spotlight News. And that does it for us tonight, but head over to njspotlightnews.org to continue following our coverage or check us out on Instagram and Facebook. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire news team. Thanks for being with us. Have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Day after day, we rely on electricity for all the ordinary things in our lives and for the extraordinary. Mom! Hey, sweetie, how are you? So, tell me about the game. I scored two goals. That's my boy. At PSEG, our commitment to you now is more powerful than ever. I'm Miles, and this is what I work for. To be my best for them and for me, in body and in mind. I need a health insurer that helps me get the care I need for both that has mental health professionals that I can talk to when I need to. Because when I feel strong and secure, so do they. This is my life. And this is how Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey works for me.